Good evening. This is Goldie, a.k.a. the Talking Head in the Secure Location. It's Wednesday, October 13th, 2010. Remember, most importantly, I rant so you don't have to. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to rant, as we live in idiocracy, and I mean that lovingly. Watch the movie Idiocracy, please. A good friend of mine let me know that I jump around a lot without giving background, so that whatever point I'm making gets lost. I'll try to summarize the main point prior to giving you the updated information. Also, this past week, I went to a birthday party and was really encouraged by the conversations that I had. I remember that it was in March of 2009 when I called my uncle from a rowboat when I had no work. I was ranting about the cure to the economic collapse. Remember the stock market was at its post-collapse low. And I remember thinking to myself, much like Seinfeld, gee, I'm so smart, I should make some money off this stuff. And this rant was born, although I make no money off of this. This rant is really a tutorial to you and to me. Let me give you an example. If you go back to BP number one, I did not yet have the theory about the structural regulatory defect that the Regulate Ted writes the regulations. I did not have an action plan that required constitutional amendments. I just remember first saying that the taxpayers should be responsible for the cleanup, as they, the taxpayers, were calling BP evil. And this was 100% of the taxpayers. As the gusher continued and I started ranting this theory to people, and as more facts came out about the limitation of damages, which was drafted after the Valdez, limiting damages to $75 million plus cleanup costs, the theory took shape. When the $20 billion settlement was reached, and Russian Fox News and Joe Barton started calling it extortion. That was the uh, $20 billion uh, Obama and BP settlement. My theory clarified. The success of this rant is proven through that evolution. You should be proud because I could not have done it without you. Maybe we'll never get the needed constitutional amendments through, but at least we know what the defect is. Let me summarize what I'll be talking about today. I'll talk a little more about abolishing public education. I'll talk about the drug war and current messages about California. I'll talk about the commons in terms of incentives related to garbage bins and recycling. I will talk about the new BS regulations for offshore drilling as election messaging. I'll talk about how Rick Perry is not a Tea Partier. <clears throat> I will talk about RFID chips and children in two school districts in Houston as an abuse of our taxpayer dollars again, as well as a further erosion of privacy. I need to clarify what I meant by when I said that I want to abolish the, the education system, uh, the public education system. I'm saying this much as I said that the taxpayer should pay for the BP cleanup. On its face, it sounds ridiculous, and people are coming up with all kinds of reasons why it's insane. Through that insanity, we will get clarity, I promise. Okay, if you get pregnant tonight, you do not get public school for your child. Everyone who is in public school now or is already pregnant relying on it gets public schooling. Think, if you know that if you get pregnant tonight you do not get free public schooling, you as a parent will have to decide how you're going to pay for your child's education. You will also not get student loans, nor will you get a child tax credit through the IRS. The proposed phase out of Social Security and the phase out of schooling are the same type of thing and they will both take a long period of time, much like the phase in of Social Security. Remember, the first recipients of Social Security had not paid a dime into the system. In other words, within four years and nine months of my abolishment, first grade will be gone. As that last set of kids moves through the system, each succeeding grade that the last child moves through is abolished, with teachers fired and administrators fired. So the total time for such abolishment will take 22 years and nine months from today, with tomorrow's pregnancies not getting public education at all, but today's pregnancies getting public education. I've not yet really opined on what those kids, what those last kids get, the ones that are in the system. But I'm going to continue to work on that problem. And I think by saying that I want to abolish public education, I think we can, we can uh, focus on it. 
All right, what would a four-year college charge if there were no student loans? This is something a friend of mine and I were talking about. Probably, colleges would specialize. They'd start specializing in areas like music, media, or languages. The price of college would probably go down. It would maybe force the colleges to get you a job, or you wouldn't pay the high price to go to college. There would be more competition among those colleges. Do you not smell the free market if you could get the unions, the bureaucracy, and the legisl legislators to stay out of it? All right. When 100% of the people agree on something, and I mean on a cure to a problem, I guarantee it's wrong. We had a little discussion the other night on the difference between when 100% of the people think that houses are going to go up or when 100% of the people think the stock market is going to go up. That's a trend, and it's impossible to buck the trend. But when 100% of the people agree on a cure for something, an actual cure to a problem, I'm going to say this. I guarantee it's wrong. Let me give you an example. On October 11, 2010, on Cavuto and Friends, this is on Fox, they posted a survey question that said, do you believe that Obama's new $50 billion stimulus plan to be enacted during the lame duck session will create jobs? Now, obviously, this is asked to Fox workers, but the results that came in among Fox watchers was 98.4% said no and 1.6% said yes. Okay? So again, the question was, do you believe that Obama's new $50 billion stimulus plan will create jobs? Basically, every single person said no. I love that. that that's just absolutely, completely amazing. That is amazing. Because that's what they've been told. That's what those people have been told. All the stimulus money went, and it didn't create any jobs. Zero jobs. All of those dollars went to dead people. I don't know. I don't know what those people believe. I almost, I should have called up because I really would have changed that 1.6%. Okay. Similarly, all of the people that came out of the NBC screening of Waiting for Superman were crying and believed that the cure for the public school problem was the inability to fire bad teachers because of the teachers' unions. Okay, that was what I saw on, on uh, MSNBC. Everybody was crying that came out of the movie Waiting for Superman, which is that uh, public school documentary by the guy that did Inconvenient Truth. Okay, I'm going to say this again. 100% of the people are never right when it's 100% of the people. And that's currently what it is. And I'm going to go see Waiting for Superman, okay? You better go see it because we're going to talk about it. I know I'm going to cry, but that's how it goes. I was walking up the hill today, selfishly picking up trash and recycling, and I walked past a middle school where there were numerous SUVs and trucks dropping off their kids, and a few nearly empty buses dropping off their kids. This is a multifaceted issue. We are paying to have those empty buses pick up a few kids, and we are subsidizing the cheap gas that allows these people to drive their kids to school. I suggest a drop-off fee for anyone that drops off their child at school who's on a bus route. And I mean a large fee. We're paying for these buses. We're paying for the tax breaks to the oil companies. And we're subsidizing the car companies. At least we can get, at the least we can get is a full bus. A lot less pollution, less Gulf cleanups, and a fewer dead American soldiers in Iraq securing our oil supplies. As to the drug war, <clears throat> I'm opposed to the cost and ineffectiveness of the drug war, as I've ran it in the past. I'm opposed to the cost of the, I mean, uh, it, it kills me, the cost of the defense funds and prison costs for marijuana users. On October 8, 2010, on Fox and Friends, President Calderon of Mexico said, said legalization of marijuana in California is inconsistent with the drug war. And I have, a, as I have opined in the past, this is good cover for Obama to leave California alone. Calderon's statement is correct. It is inconsistent with the failed drug war, the legalization effort. 
They had Geraldo Rivera on, who explained the ineffective nature of the prohibition of marijuana. He echoed the Nat Geo special, Drugs, Inc., that showed that weed was the cornerstone of the drug cartel's funds. Also, Fox News pointed out that the liquor industry opposition showed the exact nature of the argument, a ridiculous argument. On October 11, 2010, Fox News stated that two large unions are hoping to cash in on the legalization trade in California, protecting workers in the fields and in the dispensaries. Interestingly, the inconsistency of the message on Fox, which never happens, those guys are never inconsistent. Never. That's why I watch Fox. That's why my buddy the Tea Party guy is supposed to be watching MSNBC and their, and their inconsistency of message. But the inconsistency of the, of the marijuana, California marijuana message on Fox shows that Rupert Murdoch hates unions more than he hates the legalization of weed. And he's not getting pressure from the drug companies, I guess. Now, I've been kind of saying that we needed to get closer to the election. And, and I'm afraid as we've gotten closer, here is the other shoe beginning to drop. October 13th, 2010 in the Austin American Statesman. Name of the article is Study. Legalization Calif legalizing California marijuana won't hinder cartels. It was today. In this article, the Rand Drug Policy Research Center, called nonpartisan in the article, did a study. And I don't know how they did that study about this illegal crop <clears throat> that said that since Californians mostly grow their own anyway, the legalization of marijuana would only cost the drug cartels 3% of all the money they make exporting drugs to the U.S. This is the exact opposite of what the Nat Geo special said, which was more anecdotal, but I think actually more honest, in that marijuana was the cornerstone of the drug cartel's fundings. All right, so we're still, we're starting to see a few of these messages, but that one came from Rand. Um, I remember my environmental law professor quoted them a lot, and they were okay, but I don't know how you actually study the percentage of a drug cartel's income. It's hard enough to get an informant in there, so how would they possibly study it? Seriously. And this is a big article on page two of the Statesman. All right. Let's go back to the commons. <clears throat> Remember, the commons is air, land, and water, owned by all, but not by any individual to which I have added taxpayer funds and the health and education of the nation, notwithstanding my saying we should abolish public education. The main commons theory is that private companies make privatized profits but depend on their campaign contributions to politicians to allow them to pollute and not pay the true costs of the commons that they use. Think mining and offshore oil leases as prime examples to which they commonize some of their costs. Think the taxpayers pay for their cleanups and destruction. There's a Red Herring article in the Austin American Statesman dated September 16, 2010 with the title of U.S. to Oil Gas Firms, Plug Idle Gulf, Gulf Wells, Take Apart Unused Rigs. The article re-details that there are 27,000 abandoned wells in the Gulf some of which are definitely leaking, according to an Associated Press investigation, which also showed that most have not even been looked at for decades, with no one checking for leaks. This is because the oil and gas firms, the regulated, write the regulations, which allows them to not inspect abandoned wells, a lot of which are leaking. An article in the New York Times dated October 1, 2010, makes me feel much more comfortable Interior Department toughens rules for offshore oil operations. Let me quote. Interior Secretary Ken Salazar presented the new rules in a speech Thursday morning, calling them a fundamental change that will guide all future leasing and development decisions in the Gulf, Arctic, and elsewhere. We are raising the bar for safety, oversight, and environmental protection at every stage of the drilling process, he said in the speech at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The rules take effect immediately under emergency rulemaking powers. In an interview, Mr. Salazar said he expected oil companies to complain, but to quickly comply. 
We hear from industry that the regulations are too onerous, but the fact is, it's a new day, he said. There's the pre-April 20th framework of regulation and the post-April 20th framework. And the oil and gas industry better get used to it because that's the way it's going to be. Uh-huh. Let's skip to the end of the article. Jacqueline Savitz, a senior scientist at Oceana, a nonprofit environmental group, said that the new regulations alone would not prevent another spill. The BP disaster occurred because standards were not met and inspections were too lax, she said. While stricter standards might help, Adding them ignores the fact that there is simply no guarantee that they will be followed. Jacqueline, there is nothing in the system that forces these companies to comply. And as we get further and further from the disaster, any suggested changes to the regulations will wither under the continued onslaught from campaign contributors and future employers of the regulators. This is all election year BS. Let's look at what has happened in an even more corrupt system as a harbinger of things to come. Just substitute nuclear disaster for this BP problem and look at what happened in Hungary when reservoir ponds holding toxic sludge broke, broke sending a highly alkaline caustic byproduct of aluminum production down the Hungarian countryside. Let me read. The origin of the liquid was a nearby sludge reservoir holding the leftovers of a process that converts bauxite to aluminum. For more than 25 years, residents say, a Hungarian manufacturer, MALRT, the Hungarian Aluminum Production and Trade Company, has stored such waste at several artificial storage ponds in the region. Just after noon Monday, a corner of the sludge reservoir broke, sending the goo into the surrounding countryside. Excuse me. The mud drowned at least four people and sent more than 100 to hospitals with burns caused by a highly alkaline caustic substance. 16 square miles are covered in muck. The sludge poured into streams and was headed for the Raba River, which empties into the Danube. It's already killed all the life in the local rivers and streams, but now threatens a broad international environmental disaster if high concentrations get downstream. It's already killed all the life in the local rivers and streams. A classic case of a company privatizing its profits by pushing its cleanups, cleanup costs to the commons, or the taxpayers of Hungary and downstream countries. Think of, the, think of the case in this country when, not if, radioactive waste that is being dumped in Andrews, Texas, west of Odessa, leaches into the groundwater out there. Or when the Indian River plant in the Hudson River upstream from Manhattan has a similar problem, a nuclear problem. Or when the South Texas nuclear plant on the Colorado River in Texas has its inevitable breach. Again, since the companies write their own regulations by giving unlimited sums to politicians under the Citizens United case, and promising future jobs to the regulators, it is the structural regulatory defect that causes these disasters. The regulators and politicians must be detached from these corporate commons users and polluters through constitutional amendments. No other type of fix will permanently work. Staying on the commons. <clears throat> Many weeks ago, I talked about how vendors of cameras are the ones that push the surveillance cameras to the police departments that pay for these things out of our pockets. These vendors promise jobs to the cops and give huge sums to the political campaigns of the politicians making the purchasing decisions. A slight derivation of the structural regulatory defect where the regulated write the regulations. But in this case, the regulated get the purchasing of their products by the government with our tax money through their political contributions and promises of jobs to the government workers when they come out of public service. I also talked about privatizations and specifically tollways, tollways in Texas. I want to point out something that is happening in Austin that hopefully is not a part of the defect and looks okay. So that it will, it will look like I'm not always complaining. <clears throat> in the Austin American Statesman, October 6, 2010, the article is Low Profile Flyovers Plan for New Toll Lanes. In that article, it's detailed that new toll lanes are going to be added to Mopac in Austin, that's a main highway on the west side, that will be owned by the state. Yay! Not owned by Spain, not owned by private bondholders, but owned by the state. Now, if the bonds are foreclosed on, yeah, they'll own it, but 
If the tolls pay, then the state will get the fees. And finally, this is a fee where the benefits for the use of the commons will be paid for by the user of the commons and not by us, the taxpayers. It seems so easy, doesn't it? I mean, this is what keeps the tragedy from happening. The tragedy is that the users of the commons are not the ones that pay. Therefore, they have no incentive to keep it, keep it clean, keep it maintained, keep it with topsoil, etc. Okay. As to a classic free market commonized cost issue, on the same walk up the hill that I did today, I noticed that most people do not face their trash bins pursuant to the arrow on the bin, which makes it easy for the garbage truck to pick up the bin. And I also noticed that a lot of people put plastic bags and other non-recyclable items in their recycling bins. As Garrett Hardin put it in his Living Within Limits, the tragedy of the commons happens because the person who uses the commons does not have an incentive to keep the commons from being decimated. They only pay a portion. The cost is commonized, and the person running their cattle on the commons gets the full benefit of the commons, but the cost is split up among all the users. Similarly, the person that fails to put the bin in the correct direction or puts a plastic bag in the recycling bin adds a minuscule cost to the total fees but the individual does not have an incentive that they can see to do it correctly. A free market incentive solution would be to increase the cost to everyone of trash and recycling by $2 per month. And you get a rebate of $1 if your bin is facing the right way and a rebate of $1 if there are no non-recyclables in your bin. Penalties don't work, we've seen, but bonuses do. Now I know that maybe is kind of a stupid little example but it's, a, it's an easy example. I mean, it's an example you can all see. If you're in Austin, the bin has an arrow on it. The reason for that is so that they can more quickly pick up your trash. The reason why they give you a list of things to put in the recycling bin is so that you don't put plastic bags in there which mucks up the recycling machine. So people do it all the time. You know why? Because there's no incentive for them not to. You have to give people incentives to do the right thing. You have to give corporations incentives to do the right thing. It's the only way it'll work. Ethics won't work. Goodness won't work. Altruism won't work. An almost related story appeared in the Austin American Statesman October 6, 2010. Quotes, Canada, U.S. unite to study Asian carp threat, close quotes. A few years ago, the city of Austin put several thousand sterile Asian carp in the Colorado River's portion called Lake Austin, which is ringed by very, very expensive homes. It seems that weeds had overtaken the lake and were threatening to overwhelm the ability of the $100,000 master crafts and ski nautiques, carrying rich sons and daughters and their fellow frat brothers and sorority sisters to move through these weeds. At the time, as several of my friends can attest, I called them the Jurassic Park Asian carp, opining that they would re reproduce anyway or some other unintended consequences would occur. Well, in this article, and I quote, Canadian and U.S. scientists on Tuesday announced the launch of a joint study that will look at the likelihood that Asian carp will spread across the Great Lakes and decimate the fish populations if allowed to gain a foothold. Asian carp were imported in the early 1970s to cl cleanse algae from southern fish farms and sewage treatment plants. They escaped into the Mississippi River and have migrated northward ever since. Really? I mean, really? This was back in the 70s. So, so it's more important here in Austin to keep a few rich landowners happy by introducing a truly invasive species than to allow the weeds to, the weeds to do their thing in a freshwater river. It sure makes me comfortable knowing that Monsanto is doing gene splicing with corn to make it resistant to Roundup so that they can spray Roundup on the corn that we eat. Really? The reason why I'm saying really, Glenn Beck is loving it right now. I've been watching him a bunch. He loves that word really. <clears throat> but seriously, we trust Monsanto to make to do gene splicing, to allow Roundup to be sprayed onto the corn, which will kill the weeds,
but the Roundup is in the corn. Monsanto writes the regulations that say that the Roundup type or the gene splicing that they do is safe for us to eat. Do you really feel comfortable eating corn? All right. On October 6, 2010, on the Fox uh, crawling ticker along the bottom, one or two alcoholic beverages in a week doesn't affect the development of the baby during pregnancy. Hmm. Interesting. Seems to make so much sense. One or two alcoholic beverages in a week doesn't affect the development of the baby during pregnancy. So please, ladies, if you're pregnant, you should drink. I wonder who put out or sanctioned the study. And I wonder if they advertise on Fox. By the way, spoiler alert. This is messaging, election messaging. This is for all Tea Partiers, or tea Partiers that are going to vote for the Tea Party candidate for governor in Texas, Rick Perry. Remember he said he wanted to secede from the union? And he's a big Tenth Amendment person. He doesn't need any money from the federal government with all of those onerous strings that the feds put on them. By the way, the Tenth Amendment is very popular with the Tea Party, as it's the amendment where if a power was not granted to the federal government, it was reserved to the states. Well, remember, Rick Perry took billions from the feds in the last legislative session to balance the budget. And in the October 11, 2010 Austin American Statesman, the headline reads, State may appeal for aid. Perry's office might seek federal loans for cleanup after Obama administration denies requests to step in. This is for federal funds for the cleanup in a bunch of counties after tropical storm Hermine. Did a bunch of damage, a lot of flooding. That stance does not a Tea Party candidate make. On October 13, 2010 in the American Statesman, there was a blurb that Rick Perry's May appeal turned into did appeal for the funds. Look, Tea Partiers, if you vote for the person who is closest to your position or is farthest away from the person who is against your position, you will play right into the hands of the Republicans that are looking to co-opt your vote and your anger and your energy. Don't fall for it. Rick Perry is not a Tea Partier. Sarah Palin is not a Tea Partier. Rand Paul might be. Last night on Hardball with Chris Matthews, Chris was spewing his anti-Tea Party rhetoric about Rand Paul calling for self-regulation. And Matthews was using the example of the Chilean mining disaster as what we would have in this country if we had self-regulation of mining. Now, I understand that Rand Paul is calling for an end to all regulation. I actually don't believe that he believes that. But it's just like my call to abolish public education. If you do not talk the radical theory, no one will listen, nor will they focus. He actually means that the current system of regulation is broken, which it is. We all want to get to the same place, which is effective regulations, not written by the regulate Ted. Rand Paul needs to get some emails with my suggested constitutional amendments after he gets elected. Also, the White House is complaining about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and all of its donations to Republicans. Well, why aren't they actually talking about the structural regulatory defect of any group giving money to a campaign under Citizens United? Why aren't they actually talking about all of the unions that are giving money? Why don't they talk about all the groups that are giving money? They're just spewing some election crap. Obama is not your friend, Democrats, okay? He is not. I was speaking with a friend at that birthday party last week about the federal judge that threw out a witness testimony in a terror trial in New York due to the fact that the name of the witness was acquired by the defendant being tortured. I said that in law school we learned that it is the hard cases that test our fundamental rights and that I agreed with the federal judge, as does Judge Napolitano on, on Freedom Watch. My friend came back with an idea that we need a constitutional amendment to allow torture. Finally, a consistent argument. He made me smile. I agree that that is the only way to allow torture. And I praise him for his honesty on the only method that would allow torture under the Fifth Amendment, and that is to change it. I disagree with what he wants, but I agree with the method and what the current law is regarding torture. He agreed. Can't do it. 
By the way, it's been proven torture doesn't work. I need to repeat that. <clears throat> also, our buddy Neil Cavuto on Fox, he's calling for an end to all pork, and I think he's acting like he wants to run for president or something. I mean, he's doing, Glenn Beck has really kind of uh, gotten those guys going on Fox. Um, but he's calling for an end to all pork. Well, on Monday night, a good friend and I were speaking about this BS call from Cavuto. This took about 10 seconds to analyze and dismiss. And here's the question. When is something pork, and when is it actually a road repair? I love the concept. However, it seems to be an election ploy designed to box any politician into a corner from a pro-Republican commentator. End of analysis. How are you going to decide what is pork and what isn't? It's impossible. I mean, that's the problem. That's the end of the analysis. Cavuto, you consider yourself a pretty smart guy. So why did it take my friend and I 10 seconds to realize that what you were saying was bullshit and undoable? I say, shut up, Cavuto, when all you're doing is spewing pro-Republican rhetoric. Cavuto is not Goldie. But it is a problem. But the idea of just saying, and in fact, we just heard it tonight on Fox that uh, John Boehner said if the Republicans get into power in the Congress, they're going to introduce a cost-cutting measure every week. Love those guys. They're consistent. A few weeks ago, I had talked about the new x-ray vans that were being deployed around the country by police departments. The vans allow the operator inside to look inside cars for IEDs. And the example on the website showed that the x-rays also showed underneath the clothes of a driver of the car being x-rayed, kind of like the full body scanners at airports. As usual, I was opposed to this gross intrusion of privacy due to several factors. One, of course, being the fact that these x-rays would be able to see inside of the homes that they went past, which, of course, was not on the website or in the story. I did not bring up the health issues associated with these x-rays. However, in an October 4, 2010 article in the UC Berkeley News entitled, X-rays linked to increased childhood leukemia risk, a study showed the increased risk of leukemia in children due to x-rays. And this is, I'm going to read this. Berkeley, diagnostic x-rays may increase the risk of developing childhood leukemia, according to a new study by researchers at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. Specifically, the researchers found that children with acute lymphoid leukemia had almost twice the chance of having been exposed to three or more x-rays compared to the children who did not have leukemia. For B-cell, even one x-ray was enough to moderately increase the risk. The results differed slightly by the region of the body image, with a modest increase associated with chest x-rays. The new findings, sorry, the new findings published in October 2010 issue of the International Journal of Epide Epidemiology come from the Northern California Childhood Leukemia Study, a population-based case control study that includes 35 counties in the northern and central regions of the state. While the relationship between high doses of radiation and cancer is well known, significant debate still surrounds the health impacts from the low doses of radiation typical of conventional x-rays or radiographs. Natural sources of ionizing radiation are ubiquitous, from the air we breathe to the soil we walk on. Government sources say that, on average, each American is exposed to 360 millirems of radiation a year from both natural and man-made sources, including radon, air travel, and diagnostic x-rays. A rem is the standard unit of measurement of absorbed ionizing radiation in living tissue. Ionizing radiation is known to cause cancer in humans, whereas non-ionizing radiation, such as exposures associated with radio signals, microwaves, and electric power lines, is not. The dose of ionizing radiation from a single chest x-ray is roughly equivalent to the amount one would get from natural surroundings in 10 days, which is still considered low. The general clinical impression has been that the level of radiation a child would be exposed to today from a conventional x-ray would not confer an additional risk for cancer, said Patricia Buffler, UC Berkeley professor of epidemiology and principal investigator of the Northern California Childhood Leukemia Study. The results of our study were not what we expected. Leukemia is a cancer of the white blood cells, the soldiers, and the body's immune system responsible for detecting and destroying disease-causing agents. According to the American Cancer Society, it's the most common childhood cancer, accounting for nearly a third of all cancers among young, children younger than 15 years old. So, 
I'm absolutely sure that this increased risk has been taken into account by these police departments and whatever other governmental agencies are deploying these things in the U.S. and around the world, these x-ray vans. They're constantly driving down streets. Constantly. And I know, and I feel really good, that they're doing everything possible to make sure these increased risks are outweighed by whatever the freak information they're getting by x-raying inside the homes and cars that these vans are cruising past. And I'm also completely confident that any nude images that they receive from these x-rays are being properly used and will never end up on the internet so as to avoid another Rutgers student from jumping off the George Washington Bridge. I feel great. You may remember a few weeks ago, I had related a story that appeared on Free Speech TV concerning California's Contra Costa County's use of the RFID chip transmitters being attached to students in schools there. It's actually preschool students. As you may remember, I'm opposed to surveillance and privacy intrusions in general. As they don't work, and there's no way to safeguard the data that can be gotten legally and illegally from these intrusions, whether they be cameras, smart driver's licenses, and I don't mean smart drivers, I mean smart cards, or RFIDs attached to our children. And whether the misused data is nude images that leads to the irreparable harm of suicides or not, or not getting into law school, or identity theft. There's an article in the Houston Chronicle, October 12, 2010, entitled, some worry about the use of badges to track students in the Houston area. Let me read a few pieces of it. Radio frequency identification, the same technology used to monitor cattle, is tracking students in the Spring and Santa Fe school districts. Identification badges for some students in both school districts now include tracking devices that allow campus administrators to keep tabs on students' whereabouts on campus. School leaders say the devices improve security and increase attendance rates. It's a wonderful asset, said Veronica v Vigil, principal of Bailey Middle School in Spring, one of the campuses that introduced the high-tech badges this fall. But some parents and privacy advocates question whether the technology could have unintended consequences. The tags remind them of George Orwell's big brother, and they worry that hackers could figure a way to track students after they leave school. Identity theft and stalking could become serious concerns, some said. There's real questions about the security risks involved with these gadgets, said Dottie Griffith, the public education director for the ACLU of Texas. Readers can skim information. To the best of my knowledge, these things are not foolproof. We constantly see cases where people are skimming, hacking, and stealing identities from sophisticated systems. The American Civil Liberties Union fought the use of this technology in 2005 when a rural elementary school in California was thought to be the first in the U.S. to introduce the badges. The program was dismantled because of parental concern. Just last month, another district in California used federal stimulus money to buy tags for preschool students, drawing national attention and outrage. Yet the program has been quietly growing in the Houston area. Spring has been steadily expanding the system since December 2008. Currently, about 13,500 of the district's 36,000 students have the upgraded badges, which are just slightly thicker than the average ID tag to allow for the special chip. Chip readers placed strategically on campuses and on school buses can pick up where a student is, or at least where they left their badge. The readers cannot track students once they leave school property, said Christine Porter, Springs Associate Superintendent for Financial Services. Okay, Christine, I... I feel very comfortable. You know exactly what you're talking about. You work for the school district. Back to the quote. The biggest benefit so far has been recovering attendance funding at middle and high schools. Recovering attendance funding, okay, has been the biggest benefit. Every day, the district uses the tracking system to check on the whereabouts of students counted absent by classroom teachers. Oftentimes, a student is somewhere else on campus, allowing the district to recover 194000 in state funding since December 2008. The technology easily pays for itself within about three years at secondary schools, Porter said. Students haven't complained much about the new badges. Most are, be most are used to being, most students are, be are used to being, uh, uh, <coughs> dying here. Most students are used to being electronically monitored. Their campuses have had surveillance cameras for years. It feels like someone's watching you at all times, said Jackery Jackson, 11, a sixth grader at Bailey Medical School. Classmate Cameron Jefferson admits that it feels a bit awkward to know adults can track her every movement on campus.
but she understands the benefits. This is a sixth grader. It makes you mindful knowing that you could get caught if you do something wrong, she added. In case of a fire, administrators would be able to see if any students are trapped inside a building. If a student disappears, they'll know exactly when they left campus. Without fanfare, the Santa Fe School District followed Spring's lead and introduced the special ID tags at their secondary schools this fall. They've received few complaints about the mandatory badges. Without fanfare, they didn't announce it. It's a very secure system, said Patty Hansard, spokeswoman for the Santa Fe ISD. There's no data to confirm that there's any health or safety risks. Parent Jennifer Alvarez said she has several concerns about the technology, from whether the chips could have negative health implications to whether predators could hack into the system. While we can control our district and have good intent, we do not control the other outside persons, she said. The system ultimately puts students at a safety risk if bad intent is acted upon, a factor we do not control. State officials were surprised to learn about the technology and urged districts to offer an alternative to families with concern they can't deny a kid an education for refusing to use it, Texas, Texas Education Agency spokeswoman Dieta Culbertson said. They can take disciplinary action, but they can't deny an education. <laughs> this is just comedy. Security expert Kenneth Trump said schools should also be prepared for unintended glitches as they introduce the new technology. Too often we see well-intended ideas implemented, and a year or two down the road, our assessments find huge disparities and what people believe is being done and what is actually happening in day-to-day -day practice, he said. Excuse me. School security equipment gets installed and there's a lot of buzz about it and two years down the road it's not in use, not being used properly or out of service due to the lack of ongoing funds for maintenance, repair, replacement, or day-to-day -day operating costs. Okay. So the school district says that the main benefit is that they get increased funding from the state for attendance. The kids themselves are okay with these things. Sixth graders, they're 11 years old. But we all know how well educated our kids are. These things can and have been hacked, as shown in the Contra Costa story and rant. Most importantly, if you will remember my true rant on, on surveillance cameras, when you say it's okay for you to be surveilled, you're saying that it is okay for me to be surveilled which you do not have a capital R right to say. So in other words, when you say it's okay to put a camera on you, you're actually saying it's okay for them to put a camera on me. And you don't have that right to say it. So don't say it. Also, remember when Rick Perry was caught taking DNA samples from every baby born in Texas? Here's a conspiracy theory for you. Did they put anything back into those babies? And I'm not being Alex Jones here, but well, maybe they didn't, but they definitely want to. I mean, they want to put them on your driver's licenses, for sure. And they want everybody to carry a driver's license. So, kind of the same thing. If you carry your wallet, you're going to have your driver's license. Also, the vendor of this technology pushes this on our legislators. And the legislators pay for this technology with our commons. Our tax dollars. It isn't coming out of their pockets. They get campaign contributions and a job when they leave public service. The article completely misses this major point of the structural regulatory defect that allows tax dollars to be funneled to contributors. And the ACLU misses it as well. They only worry about the privacy issue. We need to send some emails to them, seriously. So we see that as this rant continues on, there are almost continuous examples of the structural regulatory defect of the Regulate TED writing the Regulate Shuns and the contributors selling privacy eroding technology to our governments. This way it's working for me and hopefully it is for you. One of my Republican or now my past Republican friends said to me the other night that Obama was the best thing that ever happened for conservative causes. I had to nod I pine that he would be better off voting for the Democrats, however, and let the pendulum really swing far enough to where real Tea Party candidates and actual Tea Party policies would come into being. And I don't mean what the Democrats are spewing about the Tea Partiers. Hmm. That's all there is today. I want to thank our sponsors.
all of which support this form of conversation, but not necessarily the content. Pianos by, piano by Angelo.com, Angelo Limbessis, who teaches and plays keyboards all over Austin. ZitaDesign.com, Z-I-T-A Design.com for all of your decorative painting needs. AustinAreaPlumbing.com for all of your plumbing problems and redos. TicoAdventureLodge.com, T-I-C-O AdventureLodge.com, a small hotel in Samra, Costa Rica. CNC Surf School in Samra at cncsurfsamra.webs.com. La Vela Latina, a great sunset restaurant in Samra. Ambar Tequila at www.santospirits.com, an extremely smooth tequila. And another hotel for Monica and Quinn in Samra, uh, www.villablanca, B-L-A-N-C-A, Samra.com. Thanks and God bless. <laughs>